Well, good evening, everyone. Nice to have you all here. Um, and we want to welcome you to our cardiac series lectures that we're doing in by partnership with Eisenhower Health here. We started this about a year ago and uh, to try to increase the participation in both Zoom, Zoom things and now that we're back in person, which is more fun anyway. Uh, it's more fun to see you all here. And uh, so we've been doing this with, uh, gosh, almost a year now. And uh, it's been really wonderful. We really appreciate that you're here and also welcome the people that are on Zoom tonight. Over here in the corner is Brett Klein. He's our partner in this whole thing here at Eisenhower and he runs the Zoom site. So please give Brent a hand. Uh, for those folks that are on Zoom uh, during the time of the speaker, uh, do you want to take questions during the time or after? All right. So uh, if you want to put your questions in the uh, chat room and we'll get to them uh, as, when uh, Lydia gets done talking. Uh, so uh, our talk tonight is pretty germane or about the, you know, these days, uh, just think about what happened uh, in the heart thing with the recent NFL football player and, you know, the CPR that was administered to him and AEDs and all that stuff. And I guess he's doing okay, as far as I've heard. In fact, he's home doing rehab and all that. Is that right? Yeah, so that's really good. So it's a, a really poignant discussion tonight, and we can all learn a lot. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about Lydia. Lydia is a bachelor degree nurse here at the hospital. She's been around here about 20 year, 23 years, and uh, she's worked in the ER and the ICU and various administrative positions. But uh, now she's the, um, the chest pain coordinator and STEMI coordinator, which is an important job in the hospital's context of keeping that certification alive. And that probably makes her work hard or something like that, I'm sure. But that's nice. That's the really thing. So uh, she's going to talk tonight about as the topic here. And then when she gets done with her topic and the questions, we will secure the Zoom site and then she will talk about a hands-on demonstration of the current CPR and also how to use an AED. So please give Lydia uh, Vincent a warm welcome. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Uh, before you do that, we had a question if they would introduce yourself and who you are and your background with Mended Hearts. Because we don't know who you are. I'm the oldest person in our chapter. My, my name is Bill Stark, and I've been a longtime president of the Coachella Valley, Mended Hearts of Coachella Valley here. Uh, Mended Hearts is a national organization, and we're just one chapter. Uh, there's probably 270 chapters around the country. It was formed probably 75 years ago uh, with three ladies and a doctor in Boston who had just gone to ladies that all had open heart surgery, and they wanted to be able to talk to somebody. So they informed that, and for many years, it was focused on open heart surgery, bypasses and valve like that. About 17 years ago, they decided, well, why aren't we talking to people, you know, uh, that have AFib or congestive heart failure or all the other anomalies and modalities that you can have as a heart patient? So we started doing that. Actually, we started doing that here before National did, and we never got slapped on the hand. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. So we've been doing that. Uh, uh, in that same time frame, though, they said, and you look at the amount of heart patients around, there are these young parents that have children born with congenital heart defects. What an amazing group that is. And they formed this, little, this group called Mended Little Hearts, focused on the parents of children with heart disease. And uh, some of those stories are just absolutely incredible. And last year, there was a pilot program that said, well, how about those people that are in the, uh, uh, you know, the 18 years old to 55 years old? And there's a now thing called young mended hearts. And that's just really in its infancy. So that's what we do. We have a group of people here in the audience that are accredited visitors. Please don't raise your hand, but you're an accredited visitor. You go around the hospitals and visit with heart patients and their families and try to offer some hope and encouragement and education. And then our, part, our next part of this is what we're doing tonight is education. So now, does that work? All right. 
All right, thank you. I am the oldest visitor, I think, though. That's, that is true. So uh, let's give Lydia Vincent a really nice warm hand. Um, I'm so honored to be able to come and speak with the Mended Hearts group, and I appreciate everything that um, Bill and the volunteers do um, for our patients. Um, but tonight I want to talk about early heart attack care, um, hands-only CPR, and about AEDs. And for the reason that like Bill said, it's come to the forefront just recently with the football player, but any of us um, could recognize symptoms of someone having a heart attack or need to step in um, if someone has a cardiac arrest and what do we need to do if that happens? So that's what I'm here to talk about. Does it let me, you'll do it? Okay, <laughs> that's me, Lydia Vincent, um, RN. I'm, like he said, I'm the chest pain center coordinator, help to maintain our um, accreditation through American College of Cardiology um, to be a chest pain um, center. And um, <clears throat> I have been nursing for 23 years. I have not been at Eisenhower for 23 years. Um, this accent's not from Southern California, it's from Mississippi. <laughs> um, and I have about 15 years of ICU experience, some experience in um, the operating room and leadership, the ED, and now I'm really enjoying um, being the chest pain coordinator. I say it's what I can feel like I could do forever. I really, really enjoy the patients, uh, the community, and everything that it allows me to do. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, honey, for, for when you you always use the verb. That's not her. What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. <sighs> Don't hit your brother. <laughs> honey, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Where's my coffee? Mm. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. You sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, hey, honey. Hmm. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, uh, yeah. Here. Acai. My favorite. See you guys later. Okay. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila, shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom. Mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? <laughs> I'm just gonna sit down. <sighs> Totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. <gasps> Come on, Mrs. Onerdog is not gonna wait. <sighs> Whoa. Sorry to bother you. <laughs> I think I might be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. <laughs> can you make it 10? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. So I like to share that video because it goes over a lot of the symptoms um, that you could have if you're having a heart attack. 
Um, and those are the symptoms that, you know, we need to identify and also shows how us women can um, just try to play off what's going on with us. Um, but not only recognizing symptoms, what do you do if someone has a cardiac event? What should you do? And this is a good example. Um, I evaluate every patient that comes into Eisenhower who has a cardiac arrest. Um, and um, I see a lot from pickleball. I mean, not from pickleball, but they were playing pickleball. That's what a lot of people do, right? And so it's important um, for you know people to know what to do if an emergency happens and you're close by. So this is an this is an example. You can play that, Brett. Tonight, a local pickleball coach is calling her players heroes after a woman had a medical emergency on the court. News Channel 3's Jake Gracia has the dramatic story and the critical training she is now urging people to consider that she says saved a life. Turn, stroke, turn, and stroke. Mary Barcelo, a Valley pickleball coach, says the sport she loves is not a very dangerous one. But earlier this month, there was a life or death incident on the court when a player at a tournament hit the ground. It was a heart attack. We had her on her back. We had to cut off her clothing and give compressions. The player was in her mid-40s. She had participated in several rounds at the tournament, which was indoors and air-conditioned. Kristen Anderson, a player from La Quinta, rushed to open the woman's airways and give her rescue breaths. I did the breathing mouth to mouth. Somebody else did the compression. Somebody else checked the pulse. Somebody else went to get the AED. And we acted like a really cool team. The group used an automatic external defibrillator, or an AED, to analyze the woman's heartbeats until paramedics got there. She was brought to Eisenhower Health in Rancho Mirage and is now recovering. Barcelo says it's an eye-opening emergency. That was really a wake-up call. Anybody can go down at any age, and it's a reminder that all of us that are out doing activities need to get certified in CPR. Because ultimately, it was that training that day that made all the difference. Her doctor said that if the people that were there before the MTs had not done what they did, she would have died. I am so glad that I was informed, and it was... it. It was not a second of thought. It was very easy to perform. Heroic action on the pickleball court that ultimately saved a valley life. Jake and Gracia, News Channel 3, Palm Desert. All right, so what do we know about heart attacks? Heart disease is the leading cause of death of the adult population, men and women. Um, one person dies every 34 seconds in the U.S. from cardiovascular disease. And these statistics here below were just updated by the CDC. They were lower and they've, they've increased. Um, but about 805,000 Americans have heart attacks every year. 605,000 are a first heart attack and about 200,000 have already had a heart attack before. And about 50%, they may be unaware or they don't act on the early warning signs. So that's why we like to do the community education on what are the warning signs. So this is just an example of all the different warning signs that you could have if you were um, having a heart attack. Um, I like to tell even our new nurses, anything that's going on above the belly button, um, don't forget it could be their heart. Um, so back pain, above the navel pain, anxiety, toothache, jaw pain, shoulder pain, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, sweating profusely, confusion, altered mental status, uh, palpitations, um, indigestion, um, excessive fatigue, and then of course, um, cardiac arrest. Um, can you reduce um, your heart attack risk? Absolutely. Um, learn the risk factors, modify your lifestyle to reduce your chance of heart disease. Um, risk factors include high blood pressure, overweight or obese, a sedentary lifestyle, using tobacco products, metabolic disease, diabetes, or other illnesses. And for women, it can also include birth control pills or a history of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, or having a low birth weight baby. Um, what causes a heart attack and why do people die? Um, the heart's a great pump and it needs a steady blood supply to survive. Um, there's three major blood vessels that supply your heart, and when a blockage occurs, it interferes with that blood supply, and that damages the pump and can lead to heart damage or death.
and what causes a blockage, um, atherosclerosis or hardening of the vessels, and the risk factors, like I said, hypertension, cholesterol, cigarette smoking. Um, over time, the cholesterol plaque builds up and it can rupture, which allows a clot to form and the vessel closes. And plaque builds up in the arteries, um, can tear away or rupture. And to repair this, the body forms a clot uh, to heal the tear. The clot gets bigger and blocks blood flow, and then heart muscle begins to die. And if you see the picture over there, there's an example of the blood flow not flowing through that vessel. And then if you look at the gray area on the heart there, that's that dead heart muscle. So and that's where, when people start having symptoms um, when, when this starts to occur. Um, can heart attack symptoms be different for men and women? Absolutely. Um, men may feel the classic symptoms of the left chest pain, arm pain. Women may complain of pain on the right side. Um, women may experience exhaustion, feeling drained, dizzy, or nauseous. Women may feel upper back pain traveling to their jaw. And women may think their stomach pain is the flu, heartburn, or an ulcer. Um, other signs can be pain that spreads above the jawbone or in the lower body or difficult or labored breathing. I like to um, make sure I remind our, our new nurses that, you know, typically men have the typical symptoms um, and women, it's not that they don't have the typical symptoms, but they have those additional symptoms as well. So don't just don't ignore it. Don't try to say it's something else. Um, what are the types or stages of heart attacks and how can you help? Um, there's three presentations of a heart attack. There's the heart attack that stops you dead in your tracks. That's the CPR scene. Um, obviously, uh, you want to call 911, begin CPR, push hard and push fast. Um, and heart attack, um, there's the heart attack where early damage is taking place. And this patient's experiencing those um, significant symptoms. Call 911, keep the patient calm or there's the, the heart attack that's just beginning. And this is where EHAC um, can be very beneficial. Um, there's minimal symptoms, maximal denial, and this is the most difficult to get someone to seek treatment, but it's better to seek treatment early. You don't wanna be in that, um, you don't wanna um, have the cardiac arrest. So it's much, much better um, to seek treatment early. Um, is there a secret to getting someone to medical care? Um, the first responder or bystander must understand the time to help the patient is in the beginning stages. Be prepared to be persistent with the patient to get checked out in the emergency room. And it's important to be proactive and heart smart um, and timely action uh, can solve the problem. And why is denial such an important part of the heart attack problem? It's part of our lifestyle. Um, we forget about ourselves. So we think that we are indestructible. We only want to face reality when we're taken to our knees. And how can you help someone? Um, a patient's status can change very quickly. Um, you, they can go from conscious to unconscious. So learn CPR, understand how to use an AED, call 911. Um, I, after we get done here, I have um, our mannequin here and I'm happy to demonstrate and let anyone try it. And you can also listen. Um, to the AED. So if you've never heard one, we're going to get it out. You can listen to it so you understand. It gives you very clear instructions. Um, so we have that after, after the lecture. Why do we say eHack saves lives? Think of eHack as a life hack. eHack, or early heart attack care, is an educational program that saves hearts. Did you know that heart attacks may have beginnings. We call these the early signs and symptoms. Did you know that some people may have a higher chance of having a heart attack? We call these risk factors. Did you know that emergency services and ambulances have the capabilities to save your heart? This is why we ask you to call 911. Did you know that it can be hard to convince someone to call 911? We do and we share these life-saving scenarios. The eHack Education course provides all of this information to help you recognize and respond to save a heart. So take the course today and learn this valuable life hack. And remember, when in doubt, call 911 because eHack saves lives.
And I evaluate a lot of patients that don't call 911. They think they can get to um, the emergency room much faster than the ambulance can get them there. Um, I would just like to say, just remind um, those that you love and remember yourself that the ambulance is an extension of our emergency room. They start emergency care right away. They get the IVs started. They can give you medications. Most importantly, they get that ECG in the field, and they can recognize if you are having a cardiac event that needs to go right away to the cath lab. Um, and that's part of what I monitor at the uh, at Eisenhower. Our goal is to get you, our accreditation goal is to get you or, or anyone who comes in like that that needs to get to the cath lab immediately. Our goal is from door to balloon is 90 minutes. Our hospital goal is 60 minutes. Our fastest um, since I've been doing this is 25 minutes. But the only way that we can do that is early activation. And we activate the cath lab before um, the patient even arrives. So you can imagine like right now, the cath lab's not here. So if something were to happen, it's very important um, for someone in the community to call 911. So that way, if it's identified, then we can get the cath lab coming in as they're coming in. Um, so it's very, very important. Even, even if you think you can get here faster than the ambulance, that means you're getting to the lobby. And I'm sure y'all have been to the lobby before. <laughs> we do have ways to expedite your care. If you come in with specific, specific symptoms, our goal, if you come in through the lobby, is to get that ECG within 10 minutes. And they do a really good job of that. Right now, our time is at eight minutes. So we're doing really good. Um, but th there's obstacles that get in the way if you're driving yourself. You have to find a place to park. You have to walk to the front of the emergency room. Once you get there, there could be a line. So just don't take a chance with anyone, with yourself or anyone that you love. During the start of the pandemic, after kind of sitting around for a while, I just felt really out of shape. <laughs> and I would have sometimes like a sensation in my chest that just felt like a burning sensation that I thought was maybe heartburn or something like that. Fast forward to November 2021. I'm actually a competitive West Coast swing dancer. I was dancing with a really good friend of mine and came out of a move and then all of a sudden I just felt really dizzy. There were three nurses that were there and um, they performed CPR and used an AED to shock me back a couple of times. When I got to the hospital, they call a cardiologist and he's running all the tests. We did the cardiac catheterization the next morning and I woke up and he was like, four of your arteries are blocked. And so he said, we're gonna have to do a quadruple bypass. High cholesterol ran in my family. I knew since the age of 25 that I had extremely high cholesterol levels, but I didn't really know like how serious it was. I remember I'd go to the doctor's appointment and he'd ask me, are you taking your medicine? And I'd be like, no. We can do our part to help reduce the chances of developing heart disease and, and having something traumatic happen in our lives. American Heart Association is one of the leaders in CPR training. And if it wasn't for CPR, <laughs> I actually wouldn't be alive today. It's been amazing to dance again. It, it brings me so much joy. It just felt like, you know, the place where I almost died is the place where I feel the most alive. So um, the next video that I'm gonna show is um, demonstrating hands-only CPR and an AED. And we say hands-only CPR because if you're certified and you have the resources, um, to do rescue breaths and chest compressions, then great. But a lot of people are not certified and we want the community to know that you can still save a life. You can still do um, chest compressions. Not, don't worry about the um, compression to breath ratio. Just do compressions until um, emergency services ar arrives. You can save a life. And so this is, a, this is a just giving you an example. 
If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, it is important to act fast. Helping to save a life is easier than you might think. You have been performing hands-only CPR on an adult when the AED arrives. You have the victim face up on a firm, flat surface and are ready to continue hands-only CPR with an AED. You must remove all clothes that cover the chest, as AED pads must not be placed over any clothing or jewelry. CPR combined with using an AED, automated external defibrillator, provides the best chance of saving a life. If possible, use an AED every time you provide CPR. AEDs are safe, accurate, and easy to use. Once you turn on the AED, follow the prompts. The AED will check to see if the person needs a shock and will prompt you to deliver a shock if needed or resume CPR. AEDs may have two sets of pads. Ensure you use adult pads on anyone who has shown signs of puberty and older. Turn the AED on and follow the prompts, which will tell you everything you need to do. Peel away the backing from the pads. Ensure there is nothing between the pad and the person's bare skin. Plug in pads connector. Plug the pads connector into the AED if necessary. Follow the prompts and let the AED analyze. Analyzing heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. And make sure that no one is touching the person. The AED will analyze the heart rhythm. If the AED tells you that a shock is not needed, resume hands-only CPR. Shock advised. Charging. Stay clear of patient. If the AED advises a shock, deliver a shock. Loudly state, clear and make sure that no one is touching the person. Push the shock button. Deliver shock now. Deliver shock now. Shock delivered. Immediately resume hands-only CPR until help arrives or the AED prompts you to pause. You will likely need to repeat several cycles of compressions and shocks. Begin CPR, start with compressions. Follow the prompts from your AED until help arrives. Try not to interrupt compressions for more than 10 seconds and follow the prompts from the AED. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But know that CPR combined with using an AED provides the best chance of saving a life. If possible, use an AED every time you provide CPR. Again, if you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to start hands-only CPR. Remember, call 911 and ask someone to get an AED, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until the AED and help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. Well, this, this is just a fun little video. So this summer I had my nephew here, he stayed with me and I have to go and educate kids also um, on hands-only CPR, what to do in case of an emergency, just like the kid in the first video recognized the symptoms. We want, we want to educate the community as a whole. And so I showed him um, that video that I just showed you guys. And I said, I need something that's gonna grab attention to kids a little bit better. And so he made me this video. We'll see if it'll play. Hey, boys and girls, and my name is... Anyways, today we're going to be talking about CPR. This lady wants some chicken. And the chicken saw and fainted. Don't worry, call 911, and while the ambulance are on the way, put both your hands together and bump to the sound of this music. There you go, now you know. That's just for fun. Um, these are just some of the site resources that I use. There is a lot in there about Go Red for Women. Women um, sometimes are, have historically have been overlooked for cardiovascular disease, and so we're just trying to raise awareness don't um, ignore any symptoms and advocate for yourself. Um, and so, sorry, men, if there was a lot in there about women, but I'm a woman and <laughs> I'm just trying to raise awareness. 
And a lot of the studies I actually learned today, we had a, a, cardio, a, a cardiologist come and speak, and I was not aware of how many of the studies um, that have been done, and no women were even included in the studies. I think that's it. Any questions? Anything that I can answer? Yes, sir. I've been wondering for quite some time for the person who has a as a past patient of open heart surgery with the mm -hmm. sternum and so forth. Uh, I'm presuming that with mo uh, most, if not all cases, the sternum has been healed well enough to withstand the bumping. Is that correct? Yes, it should. Yeah. Linda, can you um, repeat the question when someone asks in the room? That would be helpful. Yes, he's asking if someone had, uh, had heart surgery in the past, um, they have recover fully recovered. Um, would the sternum be okay to do chest compressions on? And um, there is no teaching really in, even when you're getting certified to do anything different if someone has had um, heart surgery, so. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. As a heart patient, I'm very aware of what's going on in my body. And anytime I get a pain in my arm or my stomach or whatever, I think it's the precursor to a heart attack. I had a panic attack one day, came to the hospital. I thought I was having a heart attack. It was a panic attack. So what do I do? Do I just come every time I feel something or what? So I can tell you because I evaluate all the patients that come in. And as far as all the patients who come into the hospital, we have about anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 who come in with the symptoms, right, of having a heart attack. We have to evaluate them all the same. For chest pain specific, they're coming in with chest pain. We have about 350 to 400 um, that come in a month. But as far as getting rushed to the cath lab immediately, there's a sm very small percentage of those. But do you really want to take a risk? You know, it's, it's more important to pay attention to the symptoms, do the right thing for yourself. I just recently had to help a friend who told me they were having chest pain. And, you know, he was like, it's probably just GERD, Lydia. And I said, 80% chance it is, but you're way too important to me to give that 20% chance that it, you could be having a heart attack. So, I, you know, I would just say, don't, you know, don't ignore the symptoms, make sure you're on top of them. Um, yeah, it's, it's not worth risking. Regarding cholesterol, if your HDL is between 90 and 100, but you still have some high LDL, is that danger or does the HDL help? So I don't like to give medical advice. I'm not a physician. I would just say make sure you're, you're working with your physician and, and getting advice on how to keep your cholesterol under control, um, you know, because it, it does put you at risk you know, when, when, when they're not in line. We do have a chat question. Yeah. Um, do they still have a compression, whoops, there it is, compression breathing numbers 15-2 or 5-1? They do, and if you take the certification class, they go over exactly what that is, but that's why I try to come and speak to the community about not to worry about the compression to breath ratio. Um, because more than likely, if you're in the field, you may not have someone that can do it, that's certified with you to do it. So it's just important if you're, you know, in the community and someone has a cardiac arrest that you don't um, worry about those compression to breath ratios and you do just make sure you're doing good quality CPR. Um, I know Brett has asked me in the past, what if you break ribs? Well, it's better than the alternative, which could be, you know, not to survive. So um, and, you know, in, when we're in the hospital, we do typically see that people, you know, a, a rib might get broken um, if you're doing quality CPR. Does Eisenhower offer a CPR certification training? And they how, were, how do you get information on that? They were offering it um, like on a quarterly basis, I believe. I would say check the calendar to see if they are still doing that. But you can also go to the American Heart Association um, and they have calendars listed of where you where you can go. So there's definitely places um, in the Valley to get certified. And we do have another um, saying that says, sometimes pancreatic attacks feel like a heart attack, and so you should not decide yourself whether it's pancreatic or heart. 
call 911 is your best effort. And I think Lydia has said that numerous times. Mm -hmm. What's better to do the um, compressions and the breathing or just the compressions? If you're certified and you're comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, then and you have the resources to do the chest compressions and the breathing, then that's that's good. But most people aren't. So, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. I would say one thing we've done recently, which was sponsored by the Cardio, um, Cardiovascular Institute, is that um, our team of uh, CPR experts have gone out and trained. Uh, the staff members, the drivers, the food workers, those at um, Joslin Senior Center, Mizell Senior Center most recently, um, so that that way they are trained in full CPR and that, and then for those staff that couldn't make those are doing hands only, with the idea that they can, if they're eating someone, they have someone in the facility, or they're delivering food at someone's home, they can act appropriately and immediately. Additional questions in house? I have a question for you. Uh, the, at one time when they were talking about the uh, when do compressions and breathing, it was like five and two some time ago. I don't know if that's current or not. Uh, we also had a lecture one time where they said, well, you know, if you just do five compressions, that's about what it takes to finally get blood moving around in your body. And so if you only do five, that may not be adequate. Could you comment on that and perhaps what the certification would people would do? Would they do 10, 20, or whatever that might be? I believe it's 30 to 2 now, um, but it depends on if you're by yourself or if you have someone with you. So uh, that's why I encourage everyone to go to a certification class to get the appropriate training, you know, for that. Because mm -hmm. it depends on the scenario. Yeah. So, so is that five compressions kind of about right to get the blood moving? Oh, I don't, I mean, you should hopefully from the first compression be giving a good enough to get that, get the blood moving as far as like how much it circulates after so many compressions. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I apologize. Sorry about that. Here, I can give you this. Additional questions. I've also indicated to uh, those online, feel free to unmute yourself and should be able to hear you if you want to ask a question. Our hybrid Zoom in person is always a question whether things will work. <laughs> Right, nothing from the audience online, but um, Lydia, can you tell us, uh, I guess, one question. It's like when people, um, I sat through yesterday, we did a, a lecture with uh, Susan Velde, one of our nurses on uh, emergency versus urgency and the whole, the difference between when you should go to the uh, uh, whatever condition, to urgent care versus the emergency room. Can you maybe say from a nursing perspective in your experience, when someone is feeling these symptoms, which you're talking about, we don't know if it's a stroke, we don't know if it's a heart attack, we don't know what it is. What is the best procedure and the plan forward? Those, the symptoms that we were talking about today definitely are, they need emergency care because they're going to have, you're going to have the right resources if something were going on. You have the right resources there. It's not another roadblock to getting you the emergency care. Um, urgent care, I like to, you know, tell people like it's something that maybe your doctor probably could take care of, but it's really difficult to get in with your physician in a timely fashion, right? Um, so those are the things, you know, that are urgent. Um, you know, you need you need those resources. However, um, it's not necessarily emergent. Um, but if you're having those symptoms that we discussed. Um, I, those, those are emergencies. So you would want to call 911 and make sure that you're getting appropriate care. And then another question that came up last night was in regards to emergency. Once you call 911 and you're cognizant enough to dictate 
I would like to go to Eisenhower versus I would like to go to JFK or, or another hospital, Desert Regional. You know, you're trying to dictate to the trained professionals where you should go, and they will, correct me if I'm wrong, assess your situation immediately, take you to the closest trauma and or emergency room to get the care you need. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And we do have another question. Are there differences between stroke symptoms and heart attack symptoms? Yes, well, stroke symptoms are more neurological. So you might have trouble um, speaking. You may have um, uh, droopy on one side. Maybe the smile is not equal. Trouble walking, dizziness. Those are more signs of stroke. Um, but when you think about um, cardiovascular disease and what causes it, um, the things that cause a heart attack are the same um, types of risk factors that, you, that put you at risk for stroke as well. Thank you. Yes, questions behind you, Bill. Yeah, so the gentleman was saying that um, he was at home and fell and hurt his foot. And when the ambulance came, they wanted to take him to Desert Regional because it was a trauma center. Um, but he's uh, just a mile and a half from Eisenhower. Um, so they do have standards that they are supposed to, um, you know, adhere to. Um, we are a trauma center now. Um, but there still are standards um, that they have to follow. I am not as familiar with all of the standards with the trauma, um, but uh, I'm not sure when this occurred, but Desert Regional was, um, you know, one of the only trauma centers in the Valley. So that would have been appropriate to take someone who had um, a possible um, fracture to, to that facility. But now we are a trauma center, so hopefully that um, wouldn't happen, but, um, you know, there's also certain things that we can accept based on our, um, level of our, our trauma center level. Go ahead. Another question behind you, Bill? Or in the back? So I cannot speak to trauma. I can speak to chest pain. And as a STEMI receiving center, we are not allowed to divert those patients. Um, it, we are no diversion. And the only way that we would divert is if we are having an internal emergency, which would mean like the cath lab was flooded or, you know, we did not have the resources to appropriately care for you, but not resources being staff. If you're coming in and you are um, identified as being someone that needs to be rushed to the cath lab, um, you're going to get uh, the treatment. You're going to get all the resources that you need and you're going to get there in a timely fashion. Yeah, I, I can't speak to tra what the trauma guidelines are. I apologize. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would hope it would be the same, but I, I can't really speak to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we do this. Early heart attack care. Pay attention to those symptoms early and, um, and, and get evaluated. Absolutely. We do have one in the chat and then we'll come back to live. So, um, do you suggest that anyone who lives alone and may be at risk for either heart attack or stroke, that they have a MediAlert uh, system, button, beeper, watch, something? Um, what would you recommend in that regard? 
Yes, um, I'm not as familiar with those. I've not used them. However, um, if it were um, a loved one of mine, that's exactly what I would want because sometimes if something were to happen, you're not going to be able to get to your phone. I mean, we have the smartphone capability now where you can just yell out, hey, Siri, or hey, Alexa, call whatever. So we do have more resources than we used to. However, if it were my loved one, I would for sure want to know that they, with a push of a button, could get the resources that they need. Oh, okay. Alexa will not call 911. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. So my father was having passing out spells and um, he, like I told you, we're from Mississippi. He went to the doctor and they wanted to do a neurological workup on him. They thought he might be having seizures. And I said, dad, you're not having seizures. Something is going on with your heart. Did they do an ECG? No, they did not. I said, okay, well, I really would like you to go to the emergency room. He would not go. So I bought him an uh, Apple Watch and a smartphone. And I said, this is coming. And as soon as you get it, I want you to put it on. And so he did. And this was, I think, Wednesday before Thanksgiving in maybe 2018. And um, he put it on and it said he was in atrial fib. And I said, Dad, I need you to go to the emergency room. He said, no, I'm not going. I'll get in with my doctor on Friday. And I said, Dad, that's not acceptable. Please take an extra aspirin and go to the emergency room. Well, he called his doctor. He couldn't get in. Well, he ended up going to the emergency room on Friday. He did not go when I told him to. However, he got there. Since then, he has been taken care of greatly. Um, but the funny story, he has this watch. And I don't know if you re recognize that some of these will call 911 if it detects a fall. Okay. Well, he drives around these country roads. He calls it busting a loop. He busts a loop on a regular basis. And he takes his dog. Well, the dog was barking and he was trying to get rowdy. That's the dog's name. He was trying to get rowdy to be quiet. So he started banging on the top of the truck because rowdy was in the back. Be quiet, rowdy. Next thing he knows, he said, all of a sudden I hear, did you need any help? You know, is this an emergency? Do you need help? So he had set, set it off by hitting the top of the truck. <laughs> so you do have to be careful with those things. But um, anyway, I, I, I believe in the, um, in the watches for sure. If you're wanting to keep track of your, your atrial fib, it's, it's helped him. It's helped us tremendously with his, his care. All right, another question I saw in the hand up in the back. Um, so typically when you call, so if you're having those type of symptoms of a stroke or a heart attack, typically when you call 911, they give you the appropriate instructions. And part of those instructions usually is if you're having a, um, cardiac symptoms is to take an aspirin. Um, I'm, as far as the stroke goes, I'm not 100% sure because they want to make sure that you're not, um, you're not having a hemorrhagic stroke and having a bleed in the brain. So I'm not sure if they tell you that to, call, to take an aspirin right away when you call 911, but that's also why it is very important to call 911 if you're having those symptoms. Yeah, they'll tell you how much to take. So if you didn't have the 325 and you just had the baby aspirin, then they would tell you, you know, how many of those to take. Yes, ma'am. Well, so for my father, this oh, sorry, she asked, um, 
your watch will tell you if you're in AFib. If you're in AFib, aren't you always in AFib? So for my father, it was, was a new onset atrial fib. And a lot of times when you're in AFib and it's a new onset, they try to get you converted within a short time frame. You, you have, um, there's better success if, it, if you're converted early when it, when it first starts, right? And so that way it allowed us to monitor how his rhythm was doing. Um, he since has had two ablations and he has remained in a sinus rhythm. But I can ask him on a weekly basis when I talk to him, what's your rhythm? What's it saying? How are you feeling? You know, it's at least given me a little bit of a piece of peace of mind to know um, what's going on with him. All right, more questions from anyone in this or online? Yes, go ahead. Northern Wisconsin, my wife, uh, and uh, she started driving me in. We got into the area, got an ambulance to meet us partway, but I coughed vigorously. I was told that if you've got to continue to cough vigorously, is that a, a recommended strategy? Or are you going to lucky that I'm still living? So he's asking if a cough is um, still a recommended strategy for emergency care if you if you're having a cardiac event. Uh, I do believe it is it's still in the guidelines to have the person cough um, if you you know you well when we're in the hospital we can see if someone goes into an irregular rhythm. So as an ICU nurse, I many times had asked my patient when I saw them go into VTEC, hey, can you cough for me and see if it will um, have them make them convert sometimes it's successful sometimes it's not yeah. well yeah i mean you don't know what's going on when you're having those symptoms right so um it, it could have helped you uh, it's it, it's hard for me to know but you know that is it is a technique that is that is used yeah yeah i thought there was a question there we go ma'am That's correct. If you don't have an AED, you would just continue to get do compressions. Um, if someone could get the get an AED, great. Um, but if you're at home, you may not have one. If you want one for home, they do sell them. Um, you can get an AED online anywhere from about five hundred to two thousand dollars, depending on what grade and where you're wanting it to be at. That's correct. I mean, I, I don't have one at home, but if you're like here, we have one um, outside here in the Rotunda area. There's an there's an AED. Um, most gyms have an AED. Um, most public areas have AEDs. So that's why it's important to try to educate the community so they, they know to look for them. Um, I did a lecture at a high school for a sports medicine group. And, you know, that was one of the things he did. Go find, tell me where all the AEDs are on campus. They had three on campus. But it was really good for those students to know where they are. Let's call 911 is to take that aspirin and, and then rather than just take it with water, you can chew it. Yeah, a lot of they usually will tell you to chew it and think it absorbs faster that way. The aspirin. He was asking the aspirin. Um, sometimes they tell you to chew it, and that, that's correct. All right. Any last question, and then we'll get into, um, we'll shut off Zoom, and then we'll get into um, just a couple of examples, and we'll do our mannequin, and yeah. let me try some. Yes, please come try some CPU. Any last comments, Bill, or people online? Uh, yes, I do. Oh. Step on up. Let's give Lydia a hand. <laughs> I'd just like a couple of announcements or that we can make to apply to everybody that's, that, that's on Zoom and or here. Uh, next month, we'll have another meeting, uh, Zoom and here. It's going to be on cardiac rehab. And for those who are locally here, the uh, new Yenka Wellness Center was open just this last week. And I went over there today to look at it. My goodness, pretty fancy place over there. Wow. So the, the new center is available now. The old center is absolutely vacant. It looks like they're going to have a homeless shelter or something, and I'm not sure. 
that's what it looks like. Uh, <clears throat> that's going to be on March 9th. This, the, the next year is next on uh, March 9th. Go to eisenhowerhealth.org slash calendar and you can register for that. And that's really helpful for us to do that. Um, there are a bunch of previous lectures that are on Eisenhower's health site.org. And, and uh, we just had one with Dr. Logston, who was one of the surgeons here. He did a really com uh, comprehensive discussion about the surgeon's approach to what they can do to help out an AFib working with the electrophysiologist. That was a really wonderful lecture. Many of you saw that. Uh, we've had Dr. Rubin on electrophysiologist on AFib. We've had Dr. Feldman, um, Dr. Pangalori, and a bunch of them. So go to that website. It's really very informative, and there's videos and all kinds of stuff you can look through there, lectures. You got some more information, Brett? Yeah, the website skills. You can go to our website, EisenhowerHealth.org, and uh, put in videos. You'll see it. Um, but you can also go to YouTube and uh, just put in Eisenhower Health. And you can follow us in all of our lectures um, dating back to 2020 and some of 2019. Um, and we're done by specialty. So we have our cancer, our specialty areas. Obviously, we have Desert Orthopedic, we have Cardiovascular Institute, we have our cancer side. Um, there's a lot of things on pain management, addiction medicine with our fellows. Um, so all of those videos, podcasts um, are not lengthy in some cases, but they're all online for easy access. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, there's a final note, uh, a bit of sadness. Um, for you folks that have been heart patients here at Eisenhower, and new Dr. Charlie Schaefer. Uh, Dr. Schaefer passed away on uh, February 5th, and uh, he was a great supporter of everybody in cardiology kind of stuff, and uh, certainly a supporter of what we do at Mended Hearts. He came and lectured to us many times, reviewed some of the papers that we hand out, and all kinds of stuff, and Charlie was a really nice man. You could really sit down and talk with him a lot. He was a lot. So, uh, we all kind of wish his wife well and say prayers for them. And uh, anyway, that that's the, I don't want to say any more about that one, but Charlie was a wonderful man. We really, we all really miss him. So uh, there's a, a note that came up on the, I just saw it here. It says from some lady that Charlie was a very wonderful man. And uh, yeah, and it must've been, a, she must've been a patient of him. So that's wonderful. Anyway. So that's going to kind of wrap it up in terms of our Zoom session tonight. We want you, to, we'd love to have you all hang around because Lydia's going to really show us how to do this up here. And some of you may want to take part in that. You're welcome to do that. Uh, and then afterwards, some of you have been talking about uh, let's stay around and do a, a, some uh, a personal talk about AFib or whatever else you'd like to talk about bypasses and stuff. And we'll do that here in this room. So. Thank you for all coming. Thank you for the Zoomers that are you know, with us tonight. We appreciate you all coming. We also appreciate very much the people here in, in, uh, in uh, the presence here at the Annenberg Center. And you'll also notice over there, we do have refreshments. And as you'll always, you look over there right now, most of the cookies are going, gone from all the heart patients and hardly any of the vegetables. There's a So anyway, we thank you very much. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate it very much.